Danielle, good to see you. I was thinking the last time you and I chatted was in New York, like years ago. And both you and I are on the platform all the time. Yeah, no, no, no. That was probably right after I'd left the Fed. I mean, a long time ago. Yeah, I still have acute PTSD there. I was like fresh out of the Fed. <laughs> and you and I are on the platform all the time. And we've never actually got together chatting. And I, I thought, oh, I know. you know, there's so much going on that... Um, I, th I just wanted to pick your brains. But first, before we start, give people a bit of background about yourself, what you're doing, that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I have the strangest career path, uh, probably not the strangest, but one of the most eclectic that I've ever heard of. I, I came out of business school, MBA in finance, went off to Wall Street, worked at a firm that's no longer with us called DLJ. Uh, Tony James, who recently, uh, he, he retired from Blackstone. He beautifully sold the firm at the very height of the internet dot boom craze. Uh, some of the equity analysts that I worked with at DLJ uh, made their mothers proud later in life. They went and testified before Congress for all kinds of lovely shenanigans. Uh, we're way back there. We, we've come absolutely full circle. In any event, I got my second master's at Columbia at night after the market closed while I worked full time because I was spending too much money on Jimmy Choo's and champagne. So <laughs> I said, you know what? It's time to go back to school. So I sent myself back to school. Writing was going to be my retirement plan. 9-11 uh, happened. I landed in Texas uh, as a result after doing this long-distance dating stuff and retired, signed my signed a non-compete, sold my book of business back to those nasty boys we inherited from Drexel and um, the, the, the junk bond desk and agreed to leave the business, called the publisher of the Dallas Morning News. I said, I'll work for free. He said, that's perfect with my budget. Uh, and, uh, you know, two, two big phone calls changed my life, one from Warren Buffett and one from Richard Fisher. And uh, I, eventually I ended up serving my country. I don't know why at the Fed. I'm the worst bureaucrat in the world. I didn't do sensitivity training when I was on Wall Street, for heaven's sake. I certainly wasn't going to do it at the Fed. Uh, but I was there for nine years throughout the crisis. And I came out and now I have a research firm and I do exactly what I used to do for Richard. Uh, he saw New York Markets Desk research as sell side in nature, and you know they've typically got a guy from Goldman running it, so it should read sell side. And he wanted it to be unorthodox. He also did not have a PhD in economics like me, which was rare for Federal Reserve presidents. So he set up his own Markets Desk in Dallas. So prior to every FOMC meeting, I would head to, up to New York, talk to, to, to the trading desks, economists, strategists, pick everybody's brains, portfolio managers, and. and uh, present to him a markets briefing before he went off to Washington, initially Timothy Geithner and then Bill Dudley. I was the biggest thorn in their side because I came up with massively different conclusions than what their desk was disseminating to the entire system. It was a lot of fun, uh, but I do what I do now that, that I did for Richard. I do it now for subscribers. And of course, if you're on my Twitter feed, you know that I, I tweet about 24 seven as well. <laughs> so what the hell is going on? It is a confusing old world out there. I want to pick your brains, see what, you, you, what you're seeing. I don't know where you want to start, but just so let's go. I, I look at the world, uh, people call it K-shaped. And I, I don't think it's that simple. I, I think that you have a protected universe and an unprotected universe. Inside the protected universe, there's no price discovery. Prices just go up. So it, whether it's whether it's residential real estate uh, in the United States because the FHA lending is up and strong, Fannie Freddie people don't know about this. They're doing something called an automated appraisal waiver. Uh, they're even doing it for 12% of purchases right now. Uh, we've got 50 billion dollars run rate of cash out refinancings coming. Uh, we, we don't even talk about that anymore. I mean, we, we had that your house as an ATM machine was so passe. We never thought it would happen again. We're in the middle of it. So when the Fed is buying- Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it.
things coming. Uh, we, we don't even talk about that anymore. I mean, we, we had that your house is an ATM machine was so passe. We never thought it would happen again. We're in the middle of it. So when the Fed is buying up more than net mortgage originations and FHA lending standards are lax and Fannie and Freddie are saying drive-by appraisals are fine, just put it in the computer system. We don't actually need a human being physically in the home. They've got 90% of cash out refinancing volumes right now. They've got 80% of plain vanilla refinancings. And all of this is feeding into this exodus to the exurbs and the suburbs, which is kind of the only fundamental thing backing residential real estate. But I, I, I give you all of these details because it is a protected. Think of it as being an endangered species. And it's a place that the, Fed, the, the Fed's transmission mechanism worked. The same thing can be said for the corporate bond market. Anything publicly traded, anything capital markets, Figaro, I mean, if, Ligaro a few days ago, a company that will probably be filing issued debt for 17.5%. I mean, we finally have a high and, and high yield. Uh, but as long as you have access to the capital markets, you're also in a protected realm. Commercial real estate missed that boat. And we're seeing price discovery increasingly. Obviously, we've seen it in lodging. We've seen it in retail. Retail was a long time coming. Lodging was something that's, that, that crashed upon the commercial real estate uh, industry. 50% of lodging back CMBS is a full service hotel. How many full service hotels do you know of that are running at 100% capacity right now? And that's the point. And that's why delinquencies are 27, 28% in that subsector. And what's next is, is office and multifamily high rises in the middle of urban centers. So, uh, but again, that is an unprotected realm. And that is where you can see some movement. The same goes with currencies. The same goes with volatility. The same goes with commodities. And that's why you're seeing volatility where people feel like they can have an influence on price discovery. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, I've been following this story. I call it the, 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 the insolvency, which is one part of this economy that is looks terrible, right? Huh? It's anything with debt attached to it has impaired cash flow. And mm -hmm. then there's this other half, which is, as it's like in la-la land, because the Fed doesn't allow price discovery in a bunch of stuff. I mean, the credit market is ridiculous. We've got massive defaults going on, and everyone's got impaired cash flow, yet junk bonds and everything else are just absolutely fine, whistling past the graveyard. Well, right now we're in a, a sweet spot in the credit markets. The, the, the high boil of bankruptcies has come off. Um, what we're seeing is very quiet demand destruction in the background. So you're seeing, you're seeing white collar professionals, and these aren't warn notices. This isn't like Disney's firing 28,000 part-time workers. It's not that. It's KPMG getting rid of 100 people here and there. It's Deloitte closing down, and then and then uh, another big consulting firm followed them. Their UK offices. It's a very slow grind into higher paying professions, which is going to be much more detrimental to the economy. But for now, because the United States perceives the virus as being behind it, the credit cycle is taking a pause. And because the market still thinks that there might be stimulus before the election, there's still hope out there. I think once we get past the election, however many days away it is, uh, companies that are on the brink, teetering, on the fence, uh, they're going to say, if there's no money in the hands of small businesses and 20 some odd million, it was 23 million reported recently, let's take three off for all the fraud and the swings and blah, blah, blah. But let's say 20 million Americans still collecting unemployment insurance. If you're close to insolvency and you wanna restructure something, A, you pay yourself a big bonus and then you file. If you know that Americans and small businesses aren't gonna have anything in hand until Valentine's Day at the earliest. You stop, you study the calendar and you say, so here we go. So I think we're going to see the second wave of insolvencies in Chapter 11 filings come after the election. And it's determined that really we're going to hang out a certain, a certain, two certain cohorts, the unemployed and small businesses. We're going to hang them out to dry until Valentine's Day. And if that's the case, then you'll see a resurgence here, uh, BCY Go function on your Bloomberg. And also, you know, we talk about the virus. And again, I, I don't want to get involved in the shit fight over how people interpret it, but all I do know is cases are rising everywhere around the world. And the fact is, is that the baby boomers, who are the wealthiest cohort in the world, mm -hmm. are 
going to take evasive action, regardless of whether governments create them. So if Biden gets right. in, they'll have some more rolling lockdowns than they would if Trump gets back in. Either way, people are going to take evasive action. So all I can see is a renewed slowdown in growth. We're seeing it in Europe already. Right. Because they've got it bad. And so, I don't know, I just wanted to see what your thoughts are. My kind of well, hunch is that we go through this, we've got a four or four month window, as you say, where we may have no stimulus, slowing growth, and a load of these small companies particularly on the precipice. How, how do you see this next kind of four months play out? So, um, you know, at the risk of, of waking the demons on Twitter, because you you mentioned the case word, you mentioned the C word, don't mention the case word because we're testing more. So uh, the, the way I see it in terms of curbing consumption is if you know somebody, a relative or a friend who's in the hospital, it's pretty simple. Either they're at home and COVID's a no big deal and they got over it in a few days, or shit, somebody I know is in the hospital. Right now we've got 41,350 hospitalizations in the United States. That's what I look at because that is what is going to curtail somebody's uh, consumption behavior. You've got Republican governors in Nebraska right now doing partial shutdowns, New Mexico. You don't, you don't have to have a change in the White House for the governors to say, you know what, we're, we're, we're a low density, low capita state, and yet, but, but in our, and our hospital system matches that population. So they're gonna do what they have to do to not overwhelm their individual systems. So you'll see pockets, but, but right now, if you look at the r not, if you look at the transmittability of the virus, we're down to four states, one, two, three, four, with a, an, an r not of less than one. So the, the, the vast majority of the country is, call it four weeks behind where Europe is. So you got the European composite PMI this morning, the business outlook and the differential between the business outlook and the US PMI this morning was one of the widest gaps in the history of the two. But again, if you wanna connect the dots, look at hospitalizations and bring them together. And that's where we're headed. It's just with a lag. Yeah, and what, what I always have a problem with, I, I guess you do the same, is people put their own biases on this and our job is just to look at the economy right right That's and so cool. yeah is the economy going to pick up or slow down in probability terms well if the virus comes back it's likely to slow down right i mean you've got your top two quintiles of earners in america the top 40 percent of income earners are responsible for 61 percent of consumption you get a similar picture if you look at people 55 plus because they simply have more wealth accumulated after living here for longer. So A, Gallup polling, and I, I don't quote many polls at all, but, but if, you, if you checked uh, Media Bias Fact Check, it's a fantastic website. It shows you exactly where on the spectrum your source is in terms of left to right. Gallup is smack down the middle since 1935. They have no bias. They simply take the surveys and report the data People who have college educations or more believe in the efficacy of masks, meaning if they're if they're in a state where most people don't and they're acting like cowboys, your most educated people are going to be like, here I am, I've got my Instacart, I've got my Amazon, I, I'm fine. I'm By the way, I'm in a bigger house. I've spent more. Furniture sales have gone through the roof. Home improvement has gone. Through. This is all a reflection of people saying, my house is my bunker. But if, if you have people stay away from consuming who are either in a demographic cohort, older or wealthier and more educated, you are going to put a governor on growth. It's as simple as that. If you look at offices, excuse me, if you look at small businesses in high zip code areas, Opportunity Insights is just a treasure trove of data. But if you look at high zip code small businesses, there's a higher percentage of them that are closed in high zip codes because people come out less because they trust they're not they're educated enough to say why is politics involved with science so they just step back from it and say i'll be out when it's safe you let me know yeah exactly right so why is the bond market not seeing this it kind of backs up a bit i mean i'm i think as you are as well i'm i'm bullish bonds because i i just i think the economy is slower than expected but the bond market's been backing up what's your thoughts about this well uh don't fight the Fed. Uh, look, Jay Powell needed to create a narrative out of thin air. And if you want to create a narrative out of thin air with really high unemployment, you do two things. 
you have the the leading sector for an economic recovery, housing, roar back. And you buy the tips market. You buy the hell out of the tips market. You buy as much. And then you have Hartnet and the Flow Show every week. And last night they were like, you know, seventh biggest week and retail investors, high net worth investors, you know, people are smart enough to read every Thursday, the feds, the feds, uh, what their purchase is, the composition of the balance sheet. And they're like, I'm following the fed right into tips. So the fed and investors are painting this, oh God, inflation is right around the corner narrative by force. It's just exactly what they did last year, September the 16th, when they launched not QE because the inversion of the twos tens had passed the 30 day mark. And they're like, oh my God, history says that we're in recession. Well, no kidding. We're in recession. World trade was contracting for the entire year 2019. Lacey Hunt will tell you, you have to go back to the double dip recession of the 1980s or 2007, 2009, that era before you have global uh, contraction in global trade. Of course, we were headed into recession, but it was very slow. But the Fed had to launch not QE so that it could come out and buy the short end of the curve and physically uninvert it. Fine. So they're like, hey, let, what do we do to, to create inflation so that we can say we're going to let inflation run hot when 11 months since January 2012, when, when Bernanke announced the 2% target, they've hit it. 11. God bless their souls. So, but they needed to create the narrative that they were, they were going to let it run hot. So they just, they, they made it. They've got the printing press. They just redirected it into the tips market. Pretty powerful stuff. And then you get the entire narrative with all of the strategies going, real yields, whatever. But what you're saying is it's all an illusion. There is actually no inflation pressures right now at all. How it's do you have inflation with, you, you, you do have, I, I, just, I just finished a $400 run to the Sam's Club. Uh, I mean, you do have inflation in food. You have inflation where it hurts people the most. But you don't have inflation in rents, uh, which is one of the stickiest, stickiest parts of the CPI or PCE, however you want to measure it. And that is going to hurt the Fed more. And that is what they're fighting against right now. So uh, inflation, where it counts the most, is through the roof and housing, year over year, 15% price appreciation. But the rental market is suffering. And that's also an input. So it's there's a lot of cross currents going on right now. But in terms of if you if you think of inflation through the prism of pricing power, forget about it. And so the Fed have started making noises about doing something further along the curve, further out the curve, because obviously they've seen tens and thirties backing up a bit. Not that they've gone very far. It's noise, really. But. Do you think they're going to get back in soon? I mean, if there is this window that you and I are talking about, let's say there is no stimulus agreed before the election, doesn't feel like anybody wants that to happen. So in which case, the economy gets sacrificed for three months. Mm -hmm. Do the Fed step in? Well, what the Fed is trying to do right now is, you know, if I could get, if I could dig deep enough into what the Fed purchases are, you would probably see that they're buying tips way out tenors, maturities way out as far as they can, because they want to see a 1% handle on the 10-year. They want to see a 2% handle on the 30-year so they can go, I, I give you yield curve control. I'm just going to slap a ceiling on this puppy. And that's what they want. They want for, I mean, Powell and Mnuchin are on the phone. That's a matter of public record. Powell and Pelosi have been on the phone. That's a matter of public record. But I mean, the 20-year, the you know, the, the rebirth of the 20-year Treasury, it, it didn't pop out of Mnuchin's head. It popped out of Powell's. So they want to be able to come in and have product to buy further out on the curve. And so they're probably buying tips out as far as they can. But if yields are generally trending lower over time, what's the point of yield curve control? Because I mean, we saw it in Japan. I mean, Japanese yes for a period of time in right. a in a recovery. Sure, they end up buying a ton of bonds, but when it's not a recovery, they don't buy anything because the market trades beneath them. It's true, but again, um, you know, it's hard to understand the psyche of a central banker. Uh, you know, the Hippocratic Oath is nowhere in the Eccles Building. They don't understand do no harm. They don't understand do nothing. They can't and. 
the market and market participants, they need to know that the Fed is doing something because if they don't, they're just staring at a pile of insolvent crap. So they, they have to know that there is something being done on behalf of them. And the reason that every Fed official has been begging for stimulus spending is, is they want three or four trillion dollars of new product out there to buy and, and continue to, to aggressively grow the balance sheet. But they need, they need more Treasury issuance to go there. I mean, God, treasuries, the Treasury checking account right now is $1.8 trillion dollars. And I think Trump thought that he could deploy some of that. And I, I, I think that he I think that the, the, the white the, the few lawyers who are left in the White House who haven't left uh, said, I'm sorry, but that you really cannot do. I mean, he he employed the FEMA for un unemployment benefits. He employed the CDC to impose the, uh, the rental eviction moratorium. He's had if he had more toys to play with, he would in terms of executive memorandum. If he could spend that 1.8 trillion, he would that's sitting in the checking account. So what the hell are they going to do with it? Well, eventually they will. I mean, you know, McConnell, this Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, said at the beginning of, of the week, you know, we're going to be voting on on deploying that extra 100, 150, 60 some odd thousand, uh, uh, billion PPP funding that was never tapped. We're, we're just going to do a piecemeal and release those funds from the TGA. Uh, that didn't happen. Everything was about the Supreme Court justice and rushing back to Kentucky where he's got a tight race. So uh, the, the thing that pisses me off the much, so much, Ralph, is that, is that never in the history of the United States has Congress so blatantly put their interests in front of those of small okay. business. Yeah. Well, people, yes, people, but 48% of landlords in America are small business owners. They've been hung out to dry. They've got mortgages to pay on these buildings. So it's it's um, it's the chosen. It's the protected versus the unprotected. I go back, I go back to my theme. I've been writing about it, and it's it, it's it's atrocious. I, and it still amazes me that it doesn't get more public discourse. I mean, as you say, I mean, what you're doing is protecting the old guard. Everybody, you know. It's the, you know, it's the 1% versus the 99, you know, it's, this is the core of the economy, the small shops and it, New York's been decimated and nobody's there to help them. Yep. I mean, I think there's 170,000 restaurants closed in New York. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, to add insult to injury, you have, you have idiots like de Blasio going rogue and saying, well, we're just going to get rid of bail. And we're, we're just going to, we're, we're, we're going to force the police to say, you must put the gun down. I'm not going to use force because I've been told I can't. So you have, you have this massive wave of early retirements out of the police force. And, you know, the white house is like barking, like seals happy. They're like, burn it down, burn it all the way down. So we can blame it on politics. You're sacrificing the financial center of the world right now between what is not being done for the national restaurant industry and the national lodging industry. God, I mean, the Roosevelt, the Roosevelt Hotel just closed, for God's sake. Things that have been around for, for much longer than our great grandparents were. So it's... But there's so much economically that is being sacrificed on the funeral pyre of politics. And what people don't realize is when you when you go this route, there's all kinds of excitement because the census has released data that shows that applications to start new businesses have never been like this. Well, what are people going to do in a LinkedIn world? They're going to apply for a, for, for, for a tax license, whatever. They're going to say, I'm Joe Q. I, I, mean, I cannot get through my LinkedIn. Every day I get 10 solicitations from somebody who's CEO of their own company because they have to put something on their resume. But they're not hiring people and they're not generating revenues. So it's... Well, I mean, there are, but again, when you look at the stock market, nothing appears to be wrong. No, here's another thing I want to talk to you about is, I know since I've been basically shut in a, in a, on a small island. Bless your I've heart. Been, I've, I've been spending money doing my house up, you know, things that needs to do, blah, blah, blah. And many of us have done the same, right? It's like, oh God, the deck needs doing, those windows need doing and all of that stuff, right? 
So we've brought forward a ton of consumption to do stuff. I, I'm more concerned than others are about 2021. Everyone thinks it's a shoe in recovery year. And I'm like, well, I've never seen a recession that's lasted less than 18 months ever. So why this case? What, what do you think? So, I mean, right now, I think if I'm at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and it's my job to date the recession, uh, I mean, but let's say we see a 35% print. That's kind of the best one out there when we get the, the GDP report next Thursday. Uh, the question is, what's going to happen in the current quarter? If I'm at the NBER, how do I date this puppy? Well, industrial production is still kind of on the floor. Your, your survey data is really good. But if you look inside the internals of both the manufacturing and service surveys this morning, employment's not there at all. So, and temporary hiring's gone through the roof because companies aren't willing to make the commitment. And, you know, CEO confidence a few days ago was reported uh, from the conference board. It's a quarterly print. It, it, went, it popped above the 50 line for the first time since 2018 like pre-trade war, because 68% are planning to either cut their headcount or freeze their headcount. And a ton of them are, are planning to, to freeze pay. So CEOs right now are, they're like, this is amazing. I've got this, this currency called my stock price. I can go buy whatever I want. And in the process, I can fire a ton of people and I can get all the synergies that my consultants are telling me and my investment bankers are telling me that I can get. And, and that's all well and good, but in terms of productivity, economic output, it's a nothing burger. It's not. It's financial engineering in a different way. But the victim here is going to be employment. So again, if I'm the NBER, I'm having a really hard time if there's a 1% or 2% print in 4Q for US GDB, I'm, I'm still having a hard time saying the recession's over. Even well, if you, also, if you look at quarters. Because also if you look at year on year, you know, if you look at, I look at a lot of the real time data, I'm sure you do too, it's all still down. It's kind of suggesting the economy's still down 5% year on year, which is the biggest recession you and I have ever lived through. Right. And that, this is the recovery. This is the reflation trade, negative 5%. And yeah. it's not clear with COVID coming on the rise, the lack of stimulus, what's going on globally, that you're going to get a pickup to above zero year on year. Obviously, you will do in March because we had this event. So the numbers get screwy again. But yeah. I no, I mean, look, are, are, are people going to be doing their decks when it's there's there's a foot of snow on the floor uh, on the ground outside? I mean, furniture sales could theoretically hold in there. And again, if you know what's what's interesting about housing, what's most interesting about housing is Richard Curtin at the University of Michigan, he has the most granular data for a total dork like me. You can dig so deep into this stuff. The people who are most enthusiastic about their home prices rising in the next 12 months are in the middle. They're right smack in the middle. So we have this cohort of aspirational consumers right now, precisely because the average cash out refinancing is $62,500. So you're seeing the Home Depots of the world and furniture makers and gun manufacturers, but you're seeing certain areas of consumption that are so strong, but it, it's predicated on A, the 55% the of Americans who own stocks, they're happy. I mean, Trump can't Quit, you know, he cannot stop squawking about your 401k is so fat and happy. That's great. For the 45% of Americans who don't own stocks, big deal. But for, the, for people who own stocks and own homes in the middle, and this isn't the haves and the have-nots. These are the people in the middle. They're taking cash out of their homes, and their 401ks are bigger than they've ever been. And they think that this is a genuine, bona fide, escape velocity, full-blown recovery. So when you look at asset allocation in this very complicated world, what do you think? I mean, how, how do you navigate this, right? Because I mean, it's, it's, it's exceedingly difficult to even look at the stock market right now. I mean, people don't realize the, the power of, I interviewed Mike Green a few days ago. Wow, I mean, shut me up. 
brilliant. But you know, he, he made a fine point. Uh, because so much investing is automated today, if investors have any kind of a drawdown in their stock holdings and they're in some kind of an automated target dated fund in their 401ks, March 23rd came to his mind as a big day. March 23rd also is when Jay Powell pulled out his double barrel bazooka. But on that same exact day, there was a massive rebalancing where all of this passive money had to flow out of bonds and into the stock market. So, it, but again, as a, as a fundamental investor, how do you position yourself when you know that everything you learned in Portfolio Management 101 is out the door? I mean, for God's sake, fine, stock, stock buybacks are down 66% year over year. Apple's still out there. Balls to the wall, nuts on buybacks. So are a lot of companies that, that can. And so between passive investing and that feeding this beast, I think it's very difficult to position yourself in the stock market. Uh, I, you know, I think high yield bonds are going to get interesting if, if, if spreads gap way out because the Fed will feel like it has to do something. And it's got these credit facilities that it's not really using. Now, there's something to be said. There's a big caveat for any credit investor out there, and that is that there is this presidential election coming along. The Treasury Department must agree to extending these Fed facilities beyond December the 31st. So if Mnuchin's walking out the door, he's not going to agree to anything. They're going to let it burn down. So, I mean, to never is a big word, but a lot is predicated on the outcome of this election. Steve Mnuchin, Lael Brainer, wow. I mean, you couldn't, I mean, you, fine. Elizabeth Warren is a little bit further out on the spectrum, but Lael Brainer, for God's sake. So it, it's it's difficult. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, when I listen to really intelligent investors saying I've never sat on 40% cash in my career, and by the way, I'm a billionaire and I've been doing this for 40 years, I mean, you have to listen to that. Uh, I, I, I know you're, you're Mr. Crypto on, on Twitter. I see it. But, but there's something to be said for, for people who do have gold holdings. And, and by the way, there are still- I have, I have gold. I mean, it just makes total yeah. sense. I mean, it's a great it trade. Make sense. And, and you know, my municipal bond holdings in, my, my, in good states, they're doing fabulously. And guess what? If Biden wins, they're going to do even better. Because it, it and it, and if Biden wins, they're going to do even better. And people are going to say, you know, okay, there's eight nine trading weeks left in the year, maybe seven trading weeks. If if there's an extended, uh, you know, period of uncertainty in terms of who's going to be president, but if Biden comes in, and you're sitting on all time high gains in stocks, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, I'll just I'll just roll the dice, and maybe maybe my capital gains tax won't be forty three percent in twenty twenty one. Maybe I'll just gamble on that. No, it's not how it works. You're going to take your gains before December the 31st, 2020. So there, there are just so many damn unknowns that I, I don't think that there's anything. Look, CMBS has got some really sweet, sweet spots. There, there's still denial with office. There's still denial with multifamily. So there are places you can go. There are pockets you can go. You can dig into these these CMBX in, indices, and but I mean, but everybody knows it's kind of there. Even though, again, in office and in multifamily, people are still in denial. So there might be there might be money to be had there. But but Raul, when you think about when you think about what the Fed has done, right? Triple B is still fifty percent of the investment grade universe after record fallen angels. Because we will, by the time the year comes comes to an end, corporate America will have tacked on a tidy $2 trillion of extra debt. So what we've done with this, we, we came into the year with debt to GDP, non-financial debt to GDP, holistically, including the corporate bond market and all other forms of, of loans, at a record 78%. Great financial crisis, peak 74%. So in an expansion, we came into 2020 with 78% debt to GDP, non-financial. I suspect that by the time we get to the end of the year, it'll be closer to 90%. So with this great opportunity of this crisis to clean up our balance sheets, we've made them uglier. And that's why you see great interviews with Howard Marks saying it is nasty in the restructuring pits. And we're in the mud and I'm, I'm nobody's brother. That's what he said. I'm nobody's brother. 
the reason that there is such a shit show in terms of what's happening in restructuring, and there's tons of them going on, is because when you tatter a balance sheet further, when you go to extract value, there's nothing there. And that's why we're seeing more liquidations than we've seen in the past. It's because the, the, the capital markets have been open for so, so long that you don't have a typical restructuring cycle when you declare Chapter 11. There's just less for, for the creditors to fight over. The so, other thing that Mike Green talked about when I chatted with him recently was the increase in jump to default risk. Oh. Because the Fed is supporting the bond market. The bond market is not a signal. I, I've been using the equity market as a signal because we saw the same in Europe. The European bank bonds kind of hold up, but the, the equity doesn't, right? The equity goes to zero. Yes. And Mike's like, this is a problem. Yes, equity may fall. We've seen it in let's say, GE and stuff like this, these big indebted old economy names, the equity falls, the bonds hold up. But if anybody defaults, you've got a real problem because it goes from triple B to out in one go. That's that's the point, is it's, it's not just that it's over-indebted. It's that it's more over-indebted than a triple B's ever been. Yeah. So, yeah. so you go from investment grade to gone. Yeah. And that, what portfolio, how portfolios deal with that, people haven't figured this out. And the Fed is hiding the price signal. Oh, yes. It, so but that's, that's because normally the bonds would sell off, bonds would sell off, you get out of the trade. But this, your bonds are here, and then they're worth zero. And here we are. So another question I want to ask you is about what happens if the election isn't decided? What happens then with the negotiation? Does that just stall, just absolutely categorically stall everything in terms of stimulus or anything else? So let's say we don't know the votes or, Christ, it's split. So, you know, the, the uh, Republicans hold the Senate and the Democrats hold Congress. I mean, what there seems like there's a lot of banana skins to slip up here. There are. And there are there's a lot more risk right now for the GOP in terms of the Senate, and they know that. So that it's it's pretty amazing to see that a lot of the GOP is thrown in the towel on the presidential race because they're so desperate to hold the Senate. Huh. And so let's assume that they got their way, right? So let's say Biden gets in, the GOP holds the Senate. Well, then there goes the stimulus and all of the big new Green Deal and all of that stuff, right? You have to wipe the whole lot out of markets because they're never going to allow it to happen. It's going to be gridlock at a very tenuous juncture. And, you know, the furthest that, that the Republicans wanted to go was 400 a week. Pelosi was saying 600 a week additional unemployment insurance. Um who, you know, where will the bank lobbies fall? You know, Pelosi's plan has another, another 12 months of forbearance. So right now you've got 7% of Americans with mortgages who are not paying their mortgage. And they that clock runs out on March the 31st. The CARES Act provided for 12 months of, of forbearance. But, uh, you know, if I'm the lender, if I'm Wells Fargo, well, as far as a bad example in terms of lobbying power on the Hill. But if I'm another big mortgage lender and the bill says another 12 months, so 24 months, March 2022 is the first time that I can A, foreclose or B, say, send me a mortgage payment. You're asking a lot of lenders and the GOP is going to know it if they keep the Senate. So little details are going to have big economic implications if you have what you describe, Biden, the Senate stays with the GOP, the, the Democrats keep the House. Yeah, I just it just feels to me the market's not pricing any different outcomes. And they're kind of assuming that stimulus comes faster. I just all of this just feels like a big, scary three month risk ahead of us. Well, you've got you, you've got a little debt clock running out on December the 11th. So, I mean, something's going to something has to be done during the lame duck, or you're going to have the government shut down. So it, it's, it, it's, uh, it, Raul, I, I, yeah, no, a contested election. I mean, I, that's why, that's why Michael Bloomberg poured 
500 million of his own pennies into the state of Florida because so few swing states this year are up for grabs. Florida is one of them. And they're yeah. still neck and neck. I mean, it's like, God, I mean, history's not supposed to repeat itself. So God help us if we have Bush Gore and hanging chads or whatever the modern day virtual equivalent of a hanging chad is. But that's why so much money's being poured into Florida right now. And Texas? You know, it's interesting because more people in the state of Texas where I am have voted in total than who voted for Trump in, in the entire state in wow. advance. Wow. So, I, I mean, A, I'll have to move. I mean, because, I mean, if, if they if they impose a state income tax in the state of Texas, well, I think a good chunk of us would leave. We'd come to your island. Um, but if Texas swings blue, good God. I mean, that's that that is a landslide for Biden. Not a but win. It, but it's what it's swung blue in the past. It's it's not always been a red state, right? Seventy six. I thought it was I thought he was um was blue all recently. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. I know my state. <laughs> So it's going. To, I mean, it's, look, it's, it's going to be a super interesting time, right? I've, I've got a bunch of questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, okay, from Dwayne, what is your view on of the claim that the Fed has no real mechanism for creating inflation, and that QE is nothing more than a signaling mecha mechanism? Do you believe that the Fed is actually monetizing debt? This is, this argument's been going around. You've seen it on Twitter. There's a big chip fight. Okay. That, so, Dwayne, you've not read Fed Up, because if you had read Fed Up, you would remember the scene when Stanley Fisher was at his first FOMC meeting, and he stood up and he said, why don't you use the headline PCE? Here on planet Earth, it's the closest thing you've got. This is before the New York Fed quietly created an inflation metric that included asset price inflation that they then put in the basement. But, well, but Stanley Fisher said, why don't you use headline P CPI? And some intrepid staffer in the back of the room raised his hand and he said, well, if we didn't use the core PCE, our models would fall apart. And so Bullard, who I'm not a big fan of Bullard, but Bullard, so let me, let me understand this, monetary policy, this is how it's made, crap in, crap out. And that's basically the case. The core PCE uses Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates to impute healthcare. It understates housing by a mile. And that is, again, I don't say that after the after Ben Bernanke got his inflation target in January 2012, I don't say willy-nilly that the Fed's only hit that target in 11 months. They've not hit that target by the design of the inflation metric that they use because it, it works with their models. It's the only thing that can give them cover to hide behind so that they can keep up the QE ruse. And QE is the reason that Fed officials are begging for stimulus spending is because they know that they're a one trick pony. They know what the correlation is between the S&P 500 and the growth of the Fed's balance sheet. That's all they know. And a monkey could figure that out. But they do like to provide the illusion that there are other things. But yes, the and, and this is where Lacey Hunt and I depart. Even if they don't reopen the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 to allow the Fed to buy treasuries at auction, which would require the law to change, what difference does it make if, and you see, you see the, 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 the ticks flow, you see foreign investors stepping back from our treasury market, meaning the Fed had to step in. So if the Fed is effectively absorbing treasury issuance, why wouldn't you call it monetization by any other name if it's de facto? I mean, people are like, well, they're going to reopen the, 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 the Federal Reserve Act. And I'm like, Congress doesn't have to do that. And by the way, in the BlackRock fine, fine print, in the BlackRock... People say the, the, argument go, the argument goes, and I'm, I'm not wildly interested because it's too wonky, but everyone says, well, um, the Fed can only add to reserve assets of the banks. So if the banks don't lend because we've got, you know, M2 is through the floor, so therefore you're, you're can pump as much money in... Works. No, no, you're not forcing the banks to lend. No, no, no. In, in the sense of how they envision it, I mean, it's, it's their senior loan officer data. It's a Federal Reserve survey, for God's sake. They know that lending standards are going through the roof. They know that things are tightening up. They know, they know that banks are not extending credit because banks can't do price discovery on their own credit books. Mm. 
with the Fed where it is. So no, you're not creating, you're not generating economic growth, but did we, I mean, we had an entire cycle of non-productive gains by building a bunch of homes when four out of every 10 Americans were indirectly or directly employed in the housing market. And then we just flipped a switch and said, you know what, okay, what's the next non-productive endeavor that we can embark upon for 11 years? Oh, I know, finance. We'll just do financialization of the US economy, which is not productive. So had companies been growing organically, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today, but instead they, they were like, I mean, Ed Giardini himself, who's been a bull for as long as I've been alive, Ed Giardini himself, you know, his data showed 56% of debt issuance, excuse me, 56% of, of share buybacks were financed by debt. So again, it's not productive, but as far as QE actually working, it's the signaling mechanism. Yeah. It's the faith, it's the confidence bubble that my buddy Peter, Peter Bookfar talks about. That's what this is. This is all a confidence game. But is it a confidence game if there's a blue sweep and we take $27 trillion of debt and make it 40? That's when you go from disinflationary pressures to stagflationary pressures. And that's a different ball game. So um, another question that's related to that then is it's kind of like the question that I asked, the treasury curve's been steepening. Do you expect that to continue or do you think it's gone too far now because of the reasons you said, and maybe steepens later for the other reasons you said. I mean, how do you, how do you see the bond market right now? So uh, a, a buddy of mine tweeted out this morning you know, a, a graph of the 30 year, because everybody's got their eye on the, on the long bond right now. And it is still, it is, I mean, it, it, a few days ago, it, it kind of bumped out of its 200 day moving average. But you, know, you can look back 52 weeks and see 2.24. We're not talking about a dramatic move here. And again, it has to do with the fact that, that that even though the Fed has tried to dictate through policy that fundamentals don't matter, the last market you're going to convince of that fact is the bond market. Because the stocks, the stocks will buy the Fed's narrative all day long and on Sunday. Yeah. But the bond market is always going to be more skeptical. So, I mean, I'm personally in the long bond. Yeah. Own it. Yeah, so, I, I mean, but, but I'm not even talking my book saying... Could we see it? I mean, the, the, the trade is so crowded right now. You know, the, uh, the, short, the short treasury trade. I mean, that's I, I checked it. It's four standard deviations short. I mean, it's the biggest short I've ever the seen. The same exact investors are all short the dollar. Yes. <laughs> so, but, you know, last, did I mention that Europe is four weeks ahead of us in terms of their service industry beginning to contract again and their hospitals filling up again? Again, there's only so much latitude that I think, I mean, unless the bond market has lost its mind, there's only so much latitude that the bond market gives you when the fundamentals are staring you in the face. Yeah. And that's why we haven't seen gaps. We haven't seen, you know, we, we haven't seen 2% on the long bond. As long as this steepening trade has been going on, it has been painful to watch basis point by basis point. Um, so... Do you think, it's a question here about stimulus. So let's assume we've got this blue wave and there's a bunch of new spending coming. Does the treasury market choke up on it? And at what's, when does it happen? Because I mean, it never really happened in Japan. It's never really happened in Europe. Does it happen in the US? But remember, Al, it's not, you're talking about it didn't happen in Japan when China was coming of age and the global economy was this massive support system and the the, the Japanese bond market is held inside the country. So it occurred in a vacuum against a backdrop of a global expansion and a big one led by China being the marginal driver of growth. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I do have sympathy and we are guiding our clients right now to focus on beneficiaries of the China narrative. But I'm good friends with Leland Miller and I know a lot of it is narrative and a lot of it is, is, is infrastructure spending. But there's going to be some direct Asian, emerging market Asian countries that are going to be beneficiaries, but also because they're not gonna be hit by a second wave at the same time. So you're gonna have two things working for them. But it, it's, but, but again, my point is when the Japanese experience occurred with J Japan got out of QE, they did quantitative tightening in full. 
and extricated themselves from the policy. They went back in. But right now, we're all doing it. Every single country is crazy QE. Hence and Lagarde, Lagarde just said two days ago, she was like, well, the virus is back earlier than we expected, so we're going to have to go do something, because that's what central bankers do. They have to do something. So Lagarde's going to go do something. But your question is, if the whole world is blowing up stimulus spending, and we know they are, we know Merkel's going to give however long to keep people technically unemployed, you know that these furlough programs in the UK and everywhere, you know they're going to be extended so we're all spending money like drunken sailors. But in the United States, we're going to take it to a different level if there's a blue wave, a whole different level. And you could envision easily $2 trillion of infrastructure, which, by the way, we need. Mm. So that's that actually is productive. Why we've managed to come through the sharpest slowdown from the Great Depression and not put Americans to work when we don't need to build the Hoover Dam, we need to repair the bridges? I don't know. That shows you how dysfunctional Washington, D.C. is. But there will be some productive stimulus spending if there's a blue wave, because Republicans don't want infrastructure spending because they don't want to give the Democrats a win, and Democrats don't want infrastructure spending because they don't want to give the Republicans a win. That's how policy is made. But if one party can take credit for all of it, FDR style, they'll do it. So that'll be a couple trillion. And then we know that the HEROES Act was three and change. And then you know he's going to start his Green Deal immediately because it's going to create jobs. He didn't explain in the debate how it was going to create jobs, but he promises that this Green Deal is going to create jobs. So you could easily get to five, seven trillion dollars immediately of stimulus spending. Then you start to worry about stagflation because China has its eye on the eventuality. I'm not one of these people, trust me, they're at 3 a.m. on my Twitter feed. They're like, we're losing our reserve currency status at 5 p.m. tomorrow. I'm like, dude, go get some sleep. Seriously. <laughs> but, but, but China does have its eye on that. And China does have a third. Huawei itself has a third of all the telecommunications equipment in the world. And they are the next generation of AI. And if if they see this as an opening, right? They came out a few weeks ago and said, we're gonna strategically take our treasury holdings down to $800 billion and we're gonna keep them there unless there's a military conflict. I'm like, somebody just said that out loud in China and nobody paid attention to it. So they're, they are, they're actively, proactively, because they know the Fed's gonna buy everything. So they're stepping back from our treasury markets like the tree in the forest that nobody hears, falling. If there's an opportunity in the future for if, if we don't get enough out of our stimulus spending, if we throw money at people, if we launch universal basic income, if we slide into a socialist light state, that will open up the door for the company, for, excuse me, for the, for the country that has been acting like, like a capitalist system, China, except with you know an iron fist and guns. And full control of the financial system. So, sorry, Kyle Bass, but sorry, it's they can they've got control of it. I'm sorry, but if they see our stimulus spending be non-productive and just tack on, tack on, tack on to the balance sheet, then you start to see an opening for a switch in the reserve currency. Um, somebody's asking about, and this is everybody's worst, worst nightmare. Do you think this debt boom can keep going beyond 2021? I mean, I is this not the the pin that pricks the debt bubble? And if not, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> uh, I mean, look, the stimulus spending I just described is going to be hoovered up by the Fed. So it, how does this finish then, Danielle? How, where does it finish? Well, it finishes, it? it finishes if and when, again, there is a perception. No, no, it, it finishes, well, based on fundamentals. But what fundamentals? Debt growth keeps going. Governments keep spending. The Fed monetize it. goes on their balance sheet. They peg the yield curve. So inflation's at 3%. They don't care because the bond yield, they just keep buying every bond like the Japanese did. Where does it stop? Well, that's when yield curve control truly comes in, because then the Fed would be fighting a war. 
Yeah. I mean, they'd have to buy every bond. I mean, the Fed would have to buy every single bond because what you're describing is, is a good portion of the U.S. workforce as companies automate, as layoffs continue in the background. I see the initial claims data. I get it. But they're still automating at the fastest rate they have. So there's going to be a massive drag on the labor force for years. So if you pay them to not work long term, and if U.S. productivity is not in theory, but in practice, crumbling, and if we continue to, and that's the thing, that's again where you get to a Biden win versus a Trump win, a blue wave versus not a blue wave. You might have more antitrust with the blue wave. Yeah, agree. But you know, I read a really good report a few days ago that said that retail is going to be that that what we used to term as big box is going to be the survivalist next time, and they're going to be badass, and they're going to have rock solid balance sheets, cash flow, because they're going to put all the small businesses out of business because retail's not coming back as we know it. So it's, I mean, it would, it's, it's very difficult for me to conceive a year from now having this same conversation. But if there is a blue wave and Jay Powell gets enough product and the world starts to lose faith in the direction that the United States is going, and if we if we just decide to say capitalism is is not theoretically dead, that the that the Fed's been killing it for a generation, capitalism is dead, and we're just going to support a bunch of monopolies through Fed policy and then pay everybody else universal basic income to not work, then you will see the Fed actually have the ability to execute on yield curve control because nobody else will want the paper. And the, the, at that point, that might be the thing that turns the dollar lower. I mean, I still think it goes higher first, but I don't know what your thought is on the dollar as a final question. Uh, I mean, that would send the dollar lower finally. And again, but what 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 people are talking about, people don't understand that, that we are coming up on the 40th anniversary, right? 1981 was the last time we saw appreciably rising bond yields in the United States. I don't... I just, I don't think that cycles can go, this cycle, A, it's gone on for longer than most, going back, way back in history. But if if we decide to recognize socialism, socialism in the United States, and I hate to use such a political term, but if we decide to recognize it by allowing the oligopolies to take over and be the haves in the credit markets and stay alive by virtue of the credit markets, then I think that we do have to see rising bond yields. I think the bond vigilantes will wake up from their but, long, long but slump. I've you'll always, see I've always wondered this is, you know, there's a lot of talk about, oh, we're going socialist, right? Some some social policies, different stuff. Okay, fine. So if that were the case, then why hasn't Germany got 7% inflation? It's not inflationary. It's a red herring. Okay, 2005... Germany launches a skills program to reskill their workforce. They have the lowest youth unemployment rate in Europe. Vocational training is not a bad word. They, every, everybody doesn't, doesn't need a four-year liberal arts degree. And um, so, so they, they've been able to stay above the fray, plus they have control of the currency by trashing every other country in Europe with it. They use it as a weapon. Where Germany is vulnerable, what I'm trying to say, Ralph, is that Germany got a return on its investment for the money that it put into its economy. But others didn't, right? So even Southern Europe can't generate inflation. Oh, gosh, no. Sweden no, no. doesn't. So I'm just not sure the social Southern policy. Europe, uh, youth unemployment rates that are 15%, 19%. Yeah. So, and that's the question. I'm still not sure. I understand it's inflationary as it happens, right? It's a big fiscal stimulus. And I think, like you, seven, ten trillion, whatever ridiculous number, that's mm-hmm. the that's what happens. Yes, that's inflationary temporarily, but I'm not sure it changes the structure of inflation because of demographics and and because of technology and because of all of these things. That's why I say stagflationary. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that I'm saying rising bond yields and stagnant growth. Yeah. I mean, there's no look, when we were coming into the financial crisis. Joe Q baby boomer was like, fine, 70s, is the new 60. I'll stay, I'll stay in the workforce. That ain't happening. That's not happening 12 years later. They're not. 
they're leaving the workforce and they will rotate out of their stock holdings and their risky asset holdings. It will happen. Yeah. They will sell, sell their homes. Not as many will sell, sell their homes because they're going to, we're, we're, we're becoming Italy in the United States. We're going to have multi-generations under the same roof. That's going to be a saving grace for the baby boomers. The, the kids are going to start- Saving grace the for the millennials. It helps the millennials. It helps the baby boomers. It does. It's a no-brainer, it, really. It, they're just going to switch places. They're, they're, the, the, their kids are going to come up to the top floor so that they can procreate, and they're going to throw their parents in the basement. <laughs> And it's going to be a demographic win-win, but it's not going to generate the same as if the kids have, had gone off and established their own house and home. Uh, it, it, it's not the same. There, there, there's, there's not the same economic dynamism as you would normally see with one massive generation handing off to another. True. Danielle, listen, amazing. Lots lots to think about. I'm sure people have loved it. Uh, lots to over. And let's see how the next a two weeks plays out. Yes. And then the next three months after that, because, you know, I think it's, you know, yeah. I, I, there's one thing to keep in mind right now. It's if if nothing can be done, then we're looking at money in hand on Valentine's Day. Just think Valentine's Day. And that's where you should have your short term view in terms of where the economy is headed again and follow hospitalizations. Go to the COVID tracking project dot com. Forget the cases. Just follow hospitalizations because that's what's real to people. So absolutely. Daniel, as ever, fantastic to see you. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.